And I do appreciate, Mike, you uh, taking the time to uh, ask the question. Tonight, we're going to look at electrical systems. Okay, now, uh, I was doing some homework from last time. Let's see if I can find my notes. Is there my notes? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so um, I got a note. Uh, I, I, I'm on a list where a guy sends out uh, historical dates about the Pennsylvania Railroad, and he sent out a note that said, uh, on some day in June in 1879, the Pennsylvania Railroad was testing putting a steam generating system in a box car, I'm sorry, a baggage car. Uh, so obviously by 1879, they were using steam heat. Uh, and the idea, of course, was that if they put this little sort of steam generator in the baggage car, they wouldn't have to use locomotive steam. So they were already thinking about that, uh, you know, like, like that is, was an issue as far back as 1879. So if anybody was thinking about when, uh, when they started using steam heat, it would have been previous to 1879. Um, 1879 is also apparently the year Edison made his light bulb, so electric lighting would have come on uh, sometime after 1879. Maybe that's what tonight with electric lighting, but, um, you know, if you were thinking about where, you know, what, whether your passenger cars would have electric lights or not, uh, that would be a, a reasonable, uh, you know, obviously it's going to be beyond that time frame. So, okay, so moving along, let's see. Oh, I got to do this show here. Let's see this show. Okay. So electrical systems, all right? Uh, as far as we're concerned, electrical systems cover three topics. There are generators, there are batteries, and there are outlets, okay? And by batteries, of course, we mean battery boxes uh, because they, they didn't really, <coughs> we don't really model the actual batteries. Okay, so oh, one other thing I wanted to mention from last week, I was, do, again, doing some research and I found out that uh, if I called these gadgets last week, if I called them either a steam trap or a blowdown, apparently the actual name for that is a regulator. Um, so they're, they're, um, that, that should be a regulator. I'm still trying to figure out what exactly a steam trap or a blowdown is if there, if there are such a thing, but all the information I see uh, references these as regulators, okay? Um, this picture also, speaks to the interconnected nature of all of these systems, whereas, uh, again, I'll talk about that a little later tonight also, but uh, you'll notice that this is the generator on this car, and you'll notice that it's mounted crosswise to the axis of the car, uh, and that would indicate that it's a fairly lightweight generator, probably something in the two to four kilowatt range, and the reason that this car could get away with such a lightweight generator is that its air conditioning system was ice powered. So it didn't need a lot of electricity to run an electrical air conditioner. So that was sort of the changeover uh, between these sort of smaller generators, which were probably appearing in the say 1900 era uh, until the, say the mid thirties when they started air conditioning cars. And obviously when they started air conditioning cars, uh, if the car was not ice air conditioned, uh, it would have needed a larger generator. So let's see, moving right along. Uh, again, thank you to Bill's Train Shop. This is the S-scale version of this, uh, part 2411. That's this, say, two to four kilowatt generator. It would mount crossways to the car. So, you know, you'd be, if you're looking at the generator in this direction, you would be looking from one of the ends of the car, okay? Uh, and then this area over here, uh, that's the pulley, which was driven off a belt from the truck. Uh, you know, one of the axles would have had a truck, uh, uh, the, the nearest axle to the, the inboard axle would have had uh, pulleys on it that ran this uh, belt. The belts on the pulleys would have turned this little pulley wheel here, which then generated the electricity. So, uh, why am I not? Okay. Oh, well, there we go. Okay. So, Uh, let's see. So for this car, that's my, sorry, I'm sorry. This, this is somewhat out of order. What the heck? Where did my, oh, there we go. I'm sorry. There was, this was a missing slide. Okay. So this, this is a 25 to 35 kilowatt generator. Uh, again, you, you see pictures of these things are all basically the same size, same shape. This is the one we have in S scale. Um, so again, this would have mounted under the car. Uh, now you'll notice for this one, it would sit uh, parallel to the car, like the long axis of the generator would go along the long axis of the car. And then this shaft here would be turned by some sort of axle driven generator. And again, 
Um, these in the heavyweight or lightweight era, they were pretty much the same thing. Um, and then they had different connections on the axle. Uh, my favorite is the Spicer drive, but there were also some, there was something called a super gear drive, uh, various methodologies to get the spinning axle. And of course, in this one, what a Spicer drive is, is sort of like a differential on a car, uh, is that, you know, the axles, the other one the, with the belt, the axle and the generator drive shaft are turning the same direction. But with this one, uh, you know, they're turning at right angles to each other. So they had to have some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of uh, gearing in there that would turn that to make it spin the other direction, right? So like, again, when I say other direction, I mean like, you know, parallel to the car or perpendicular to the car, so. Okay, so here you go. Um, as I said, batteries, uh, you know, what we're concerned with is not the batteries themselves so much as, as the battery boxes. And these are heavyweight battery boxes you can see here and here. Um, again, I put in some notes from last week. You'll see here are a couple more regulators, again, for the uh, heating system. And then here's your brake cylinder here, and here's your UC valve over there. But uh, you'll notice these sort of big, they're, they're almost square on the front, uh, the battery boxes, and they've got this sort of inset handle. That's pretty much the tip to you're looking at a battery box. And interestingly enough, that sort of handle, for whatever reason, carried over into the lightweight era. We had, when you look at lightweight battery boxes, you'll see uh, somewhat the same thing. So, so here's a lightweight battery box. Uh, again, actually it's two battery boxes and here's a third one sneaking in over here, but you'll notice that same sort of inset handle um, that, that, that characterizes battery boxes. Okay, here's another one, uh, something of the inset handle. It's kind of like the outset version of the inset handle. Uh, this, this one's under a New York Central uh, I believe it's a Bud car, but I'm not, I don't remember exactly. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's from Bud, um, yeah, based on the fluting, so. Okay, this one is kind of interesting to me anyway. I'm, I'm attempting to build one of these. Uh, I've been for a while, I tend to work kind of slow. But um, what happened was this, this car is a, uh, it's from the 1938 uh, fleet of modernism as those Pensy folk like to call it. Uh, where Pensy's Pensy's first lightweight passenger cars or first quantity lightweight passenger cars, and they came equipped with curved skirts, and so the battery boxes had to match up those curved skirts, and that in itself is interesting. But what's really interesting to me is that when they took the skirting off the cars later, they left the curved battery boxes there, and. Pensy, of course, wasn't the only railroad to do this. The Illinois Central did it also. Uh, this is a car from the Illinois, uh, Illinois Railway Museum, it's King Cotton at the Illinois River. And you can see this curved face battery box. So at one time, there was a curved outer along the whole, you know, the whole space between the trucks uh, was, a, was a skirt. And, you know, for the most part, it just covered stuff up. But for the battery box, it was actually the cover of the battery box. And so when they took the skirting off, they just left the battery box, but they left the curved skirting that covered the battery box. Um, when we get to the air conditioning part, you're going to see that they did something similar with air conditioning uh, units, too. So that's kind of neat. So anyway, but again, you see that inset handle. Again, characteristic of battery boxes. So this one is in, um, that, oops, sorry, going the wrong way. Uh, that, that one is one, it's a, it's a cascade car. It's in Covington, Kentucky. Uh, I forget what the, uh, which one it is. They, at one point they had three of them at this museum. So, okay. Uh, this is one I happened to bump into on it. It's, I believe it's an old Erie diner. And again, same sort of idea. You've got this curved battery box. Uh, that, you know, again, at some point the car had some more skirting. Now this car was sort of a heavyweight diner. So I imagine the railroad probably added the skirting to make it fit in amongst their heavyweights, uh, sorry, lightweights. And, and so uh, it was done by the railroad, I believe, as opposed to coming on the car, you know, from, from the building. So, okay. And so here's an electrical outlet, uh, you know, right here. Um, these actually came in two flavors. There was an AC version and a DC version. But on the kind of scale that we're looking at them at, they, they would be indistinguishable. They were basically exactly the same. Uh, you know, that, you know they, they didn't look different enough on model form that you would be able to tell the one from the other. Uh, this is a detail I'm not sure I've seen on very many models. Uh, you know, again, I'm, I, I'm hoping to, I, I 
kind of think this would be better cast in brass because it would be a little sturdier. But, you know, I might have to try and 3D print some of these and see what I can get away with because I would like to put some of them on the car. Uh, the DC one, the DC outlet was a way to charge the batteries when the car was standing still. Obviously, you couldn't plug the car into the wall if it was not standing still. And then the AC outlet was a, a way to sort of run all the systems of the car while it was standing still. So you could do either. Uh, and the other interesting thing about these is that they swivel somewhat. You know, they'll, they'll sort of rock side to side. They, they're attached at the top and the bottom and they can pivot back and forth a little bit uh, in order that, you know, like if the electrical outlet was sort of to one side or the other, you could uh, not stress the cord out by moving it over a little bit. Sort of an interesting feature, but. Okay, now, Again, I mentioned the idea that there's some crossover between these systems. Uh, here's another piece of crossover between the system. This is a Waukesha engineator. So what this thing is, is it's a propane powered electrical generator. So instead of relying on the uh, spinning car wheels to generate electricity, this any car equipped with this device would generate its own electricity. Uh, the obvious benefit of this is that it would, uh, you know, you could park it at a station and it could still run the air conditioner or whatever the heck they needed to run uh, because it's just generating its own power. It's not relying on either batteries necessarily or the uh, rolling car to power it. Now, that also then would require propane tanks. Uh, and I, I don't really have a picture of the propane tanks in real life. So this is the pre-sized model propane tank. These are S-scale parts, pre-sized. So we have BTS and we have pre-sized that make passenger car details for us. Thank you very much. Uh, and so that's one example of, a, of this would be a four bottle propane tank holder because you can see it's got four spaces for the propane tank. Now let's back up just a sec here. Um, the, I, don't, uh, I don't really have record of which cars, uh, what, what sort of generating system they have. Uh, but I, I have listings of air conditioning systems and I don't, so I don't really have a way. I don't believe, I don't believe there were any cars that had just an engineator. They, what happened, Waukesha liked to sell what they call the twins. And so they had the Waukesha engineator and then they also had the Waukesha ice engine. And I've seen cars with, uh, you know, Pullman would say the car would had a, a Waukesha one engine or a Waukesha two engine when referring to the air conditioning system. And so I'm believing that a Waukesha ice engine, I'm sorry, a Waukesha one engine was where they had the ice engine for the air conditioner. Again, same sort of thing was that the, the, the air conditioner ran off its own motor, um, you know, so they didn't have to run it off the car wheel. And of course, you know, that, that, that there's a drag factor there that they can't, uh, you know, when you're generating, when all of your cars are generating electricity, there, there's extra drag in it. I, I want to say they figured out it was something like a, another car in a 12 car train, um, you know, so they could make a 13 car train instead of a 12 car train if they had engineers and, and uh, ice engines. But anyway, um, I don't believe there were any cars that just had the engineator. I think they either had the ice engine or the ice engine and the engineator. These tended to be Western railroads that use these. Uh, Union Pacific liked them. I believe the Milwaukee Road had some because they interchanged with the Union Pacific. Uh, so did the Chicago Northwestern. I think the Rock Island might have had some, but they might have been one engine. Uh, Illinois Central had quite a few one engines. You were not going to see these in the East Coast. The Pennsylvania Railroad absolutely refused to run cars with these because they wouldn't run them under the Hudson River tunnels. So they, you would, you, you know, if you're modeling the Pennsylvania Railroad, you say, well, I have this interchange car from a Western Railroad. It's not going to have a, a Waukesha engineer or, a, or an ice engine because the, the Pensy wouldn't run them through their tunnels under the Hudson River. Uh, I believe the New York Central had a similar prohibition, but I don't know entirely. I, you know, I'm kind of a Pensy guy, so I, I know that, but anyway. Um, but again, this speaks to sort of the related, the interrelated systems in, in that this, uh, the engineer here, uh, you know, would also go with the, with the ice engine, which we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks, because that'll be our week for uh, air conditioning. So, and that's pretty much I, what I got for tonight.